Welcome everyone, in this video we are going to discuss effective potentials. So let's get the pen ready and let's go. So when we mention effective potential, there are, as far as I know, two primary reasons why we are interested in them. One, they let us... Oops, why is it writing like that? Okay, so they let us reduce the dimensions of the problem of the uh, problem from 2D to 1D. Okay, from 2D to 1D. So we have a two-dimensional problem and we are able to reduce it to only one dimension using this effective potential. And I will elaborate on this. I will give equations. Don't worry about it if it doesn't make sense at this point. If someone were to tell me only this sentence, it probably wouldn't make sense to me. So no worries at all. And the second, which is also very nice, is uh, this helps us determine turning points. turning points and I will also talk about this but first let's talk about the first one when we say effect effective potential we are in fact meaning effective potential energy and if we were to write some energy some mechanical energy in the most general way possible for a for an orbital mechanics problem we're going to have the kinetic energy, right? 1 over 2 m. The kinetic energy is going to have two parts to it. The radial component and the... Well, the velocity is going to have a radial component and a, uh, and a tangential component, both of which have associated kinetic energies. So first the radial component and then the tangential component. Cool, I hope this part makes sense. If you aren't familiar with this type of stuff, just think of it like this. R dot is the rate of change of radius with respect to time. So it makes sense that it is the radial velocity. Velocity is the change of position. So we are interested in how much the radius changes over time. That is the rad radial velocity. And we square it for the kinetic energy. Now this part, that is just what you would write in a uniform circular motion problem you would say v tangential is equal to omega r omega is theta dot you remember and then you square it like we did in that case in the circle since the radius didn't change in magnitude we this was just zero but in the most general case it is not zero this can reduce to a circle but it doesn't necessarily have to okay i hope this part makes sense cool and then we're going to have some potential. For example, this might be a gravitational potential energy for pretty much all of the celestial bodies. For all of the celestial bodies, basically. Okay. Now, this is the first equation. The second equation is the angular momentum. This is conserved for an, for an orbital motion because the only force acting is the gravity. And gravity is... You know, along the radius, it is opposite to the radius vector, to the position vector. So when you take the cross product of the position and the force, that gives you zero. So the torque is zero, which means that the angular momentum is not changing. We are the, going to be calculating the angular momentum with respect to the uh, bigger mass. So I am assuming for the sake of simplicity that the bigger mass, which is maybe the sun, is much bigger than the smaller mass, the Earth, which is the case. So we can assume that this is fixed. So we just assume it is fixed. You know, early on, this is a simplification that is made. It doesn't have to be made. You can still solve it for the both, both masses. If you have two masses, no problem. You can solve it without this assumption. And if you have three pro three uh, three bodies well there is a problem the three body problem and i don't i don't really know uh, 
much about it, so I'm not going to pretend that I know it. I'm not going to comment on it a lot, but it is, it is not solvable. It is a chaotic system, unlike the two-body problem, okay? Which could be still solved without this assumption that the bigger mass is fixed. But since M is much greater than the small M, and this is very practical as the Earth-Sun Earth example, we are considering it like this. So the radius is relative to the fixed bigger mass, which is sitting at the origin. This is the origin of our corner system. And the motion takes on a plane. We could talk more about it, but I, I guess it is intuitive. If it is not, just tell me in the comment section. I will derive that it is the plane. The motion is going to take on a plane. It's going to happen on a plane. Okay, so what is the... What is the angular, the angular momentum? It is the moment of inertia mr squared times the omega, which is theta dot. Cool. Now, I want to solve for theta dot in this equation. What is theta dot? Theta dot is going to be L over mr squared. And if I substitute it here, let's see what the equations give us. E is equal to 1 over 2 m, I'm distributing the parentheses, plus 1 over 2 m r squared, then we square the theta dot, then the potential energy. So if we write the simplifications on the new line, the m simplify, r squared simplifies, so we have 1 over 2, rest like write it in the more conventional way, so... We have L squared over 2M R squared plus V of R. And this is called the effective potential. V effective. Okay? That is the definition of it. Now, what did I mean when I said we reduce the two dimensions to one dimension? Well, look at this. Here we had r and theta. But at the end, we only have r here. Here, we only have r. Okay, there is the time derivative of it, but it doesn't matter. We only have r. So we were able to get rid of the theta. And we are only left with one variable. The position. So that is a one-dimensional problem. Okay, that's what I meant by the first statement. Now the second statement, which is maybe even more interesting because it is a lot more visual. If we were to graph this V effective, and I'm just going to make a rough sketch. So this is the radius, this is the effective potential, is a function of R. So you can already see, I mean, well, we, let's graph it for gravity, so for gravity. Let's be specific. For gravity, V R the initial potential will be a negative G M M over R, okay? And by the way, I have a video in which I prove this formula. You can access that video from the cards right now and also from the descriptions part. You don't need to take this for granted. I have a proof for this. In a video that was a long time ago. Okay. So in this case, V effective is basically, well, it has a 1 over R squared term and a 1 over R term. 1 over R squared will be getting, as we approach 0, like 1 over R squared term is going to be getting much more smaller, much more quicker than 1 over R. So the, Potential will blow up to positive infinity. Like so. And then as R uh, and as both R's go to zero, the result is something negative. Uh, something is, they are both going to zero, right? The both terms are going to zero. R squared, one over R squared, minus one over R. As R goes to infinite, infinity tends to zero. And this in fact crosses the... Uh, horizontal axis as well because for small like for let's call them medium so for like intermediate intermediate values 
neg- 1 over r could be greater than 1 over r squared. It could give a result greater than that. And since it has a minus in top on in front of it and due to all the constants, g, l, both masses, even the two here, it is possible that this goes below the axis. It goes beyond the axis. Not possible. It goes beyond the axis. Okay. And I'm just trying to make this short and sweet. That's why I'm not really elaborating on it that much. But this is what we get, basically. Cool? Now, if we know that the energy of the system is, let's say, like this. Oops, I meant to yep, get the red color. If the energy of the system is here, what does this mean? This means that the energy is equal to the effective potential. Okay, so what? This means that this is zero. If that is zero, mass isn't zero, and one over two is surely not zero. This means that r dot is zero, which means the magnitude of the radius is not changing. So this describes a circular motion. The orbit is a circle. If, let's say, the energy is... I don't know, like, if it is here, let's say. As you can see, there are two points for which it is equal to the effective potential, right? Because when we are at this point, let's say, there's going to be some radial velocity. There has to be some radial velocity to make for the gap. And the particle, uh, not the particle, the mass can't be here or here. It can't be above the intersection points because that would imply that the radial kinetic energy is negative which is not possible for our case because we are taking the square of some real number some real velocity and so there are two points this is the minimum and this is the maximum our values and we could find their values but we don't really need to think about it for now maybe in a future video we could discuss that but we have the R min and R max values. And this, in fact, and these are the turning points, right? Like when the, during the orbit, once it has that minimum R value, after that, the radius isn't going to decrease and it's going to now increase. So it comes to the, it's like falls in this valley and then goes up to R max, R max. After that, the radius is not going to increase in magnitude. It's only going to decrease. And so it's going to uh, fall back again. Okay? So they, they are the turning points. And in fact, this will describe an ellipse. So ellipse. Did I spell it wrong? I hope I didn't. I could just check it from my phone, I guess. But I think, yeah, we, I got the spelling right, I think. But I'm still checking for you guys. Yep, I did get the spelling right. Okay. So it's an ellipse that we have. And, I mean, there are other cases as well to consider. For example, what if, who knows, what if energy is just at zero? What if it is here? There is just one, to one point, and that would, uh, I believe, describe a parabola. So, let's make it with green, maybe. So, this describes a parabola. And if the energy were to be, like, here, let's say greater than zero well then that describes a hyperbola hyper hyperbola hyperbola okay and for this guy there is just one turning point and for the parabola as well once it turns it never comes back it goes to infinity okay so if it reaches here then falls back forever basically and it doesn't even need to reach that point maybe if it was even moving in the opposite direction it just goes to infinity Forever. Obviously, in the theoretical sense. In the practical sense, it would be... Well, it would encounter some other object and it would maybe fall into its potential trap and move accordingly. But this is the idea. So, as you can see, the effective, it is a construct that we make to reduce the dimensions to one so that we can deal with the problem more easily in an easier way. And also, when we graph it, it gives... 
it lets us know whether or not we get an ellipse, a circle, a parabola, a hyperbola while just looking at it. Of course, you would need to deny that these conic sections are in fact true for describing the orbit. I'm just qualitatively stating them as a general culture, basically. In a future video, I hope to show that these are in fact the results that you get if the energy is, well, greater than the, pot uh, the effective potential, less than it, and vice versa. Stuff like that. Anyways, I hope this video was helpful. If you have any questions, please add them in the comment section. I hope to see you in another video. Until then, take care.